Connecticut is a pretty great place to live. Connecticut is at the top in terms of how it protects its citizens and protects reproductive rights and has some of the strictest gun safety laws in the country. Hello everybody, thank you for being with us. I'm Rebecca Hyland and welcome to Groundwork. I am running for the state representative seat of the 90th district, which is a large portion of Wallingford and Middlefield. Very lucky that we have with us Riley O'Connell. Uh, Riley ran for mayor in 2021 in Wallingford and came very, very close. And congratulations. He has just announced that he's running again for mayor on the next cycle. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. The last time we saw each other last week, we were out door knocking and you were telling people that you are running again for mayor. People seem to be very positive and very happy about that information. I know I was happy to hear it. And then we had the opportunity to co-host uh, that very That's awesome right. event with Stephanie Thomas, who is running for uh, Connecticut Secretary of State. How's it been going the last couple weeks since you announced? It's been great. It's been great. It's, uh, you know, it's funny. It, after the last election, especially right after, within 48 hours, I'd say, people were already asking, you know, you got to run again. Are you running again? It took me a week to really recover, frankly, in the first place. I can imagine. Um, and so I didn't even think about it for a long time. But like you said, the fact that we did get so close, and even more so, as I've been getting more back involved with your campaign and with other campaigns like Stephanie Thomas's, and I know we have a lot of other great statewide offices running, seeing all those people again and getting back together again. The reason my campaign got as close as it did wasn't because of me. It was because of all the great volunteers, all those really passionate Walling for residents who you've met all of, if not you know, many more, now you have Middlefield as well, that having all of them behind me made me think I can't not run again. You yeah, made the decision pretty quickly, it we seems. We did, we did. We wanted to make sure people knew that we intended to run again. The more pessimistic reason, and this might be the most naive part of me, but part of me really did believe, or at least hope, that the, th the thin margins of our election would be kind of a wake-up call for Mayor Dickinson, our current mayor, to kind of start addressing a lot of those needs, or at least having an ear to them. And it was very clear that, uh, unfortunately, that did not happen. I mean, we've had our 18th year in a row of him proposing a tax increase, which was something that not just me, but members of both parties of our yes. town council have pushed against. Um, all of our infrastructure continues to worsen. And pretty much every single thing we brought up on the election, like uh, the fact that we, we pl anticipated him playing politics with the ARPA money, has, again, I say unfortunately, very unfortunately, have all, has all come to fruition. By announcing again, we're hoping to put that pressure back on him, uh, on this administration, and really uh, get the ball rolling sooner rather than later. I understand completely where you're coming from. I remember seeing in 2020 when Craig Fishbein only won the state representative seat by, I think, seven votes. I assumed that that would perhaps put the pressure on to maybe uh, change some of his ways, uh, and it did not. That's why I'm running, <laughs> and nice. that's hopefully why we're going to win. The reasons that, that you need to be running, because if, if you're not running for the right reasons, it's impossible, because it's such a toll physically and emotionally, mentally, yes. to do that grind for that whole time. Don't get me wrong, I, you know, and I'm sure you can agree, it is amazing. It's been awesome. Uh, but it is, if you're not doing it for the right reasons, it's impossible. To you're going to burn out right. pretty quickly because you have to be uh, internally motivated right. to get out there and walk and talk and, and be criticized. But, you know, what's been super cool for me is all of the criticism gets immediately wiped away when you have those really, really genuine, good conversations with people. And it's humbling to see people trust you and share with you what they want for the future. And you realize that that's, that's a lot of responsibility. If you are helping people and you are the ear you are their representative i mean that's that's a ton of responsibility that, it absolutely is and that's what drives you you know when you have those tough days on the campaign trail when you have those those losses politically whether it's you know with policies not going through that you really wanted to help people with um you need those people behind you those reasons why you're running i mean i still think back to my campaign and my favorite moments were parts that really i'm not even in the picture but was so one of my supporters 
uh, dressing up for me, dressing up as me for Halloween, or someone telling me. I remember I, seeing right, that picture. <laughs> someone telling me I registered to vote for the first time. Uh, it's my first time being over eighteen to vote, and I registered to vote so I could vote for you. Like those are things that, That's awesome. regardless of the outcome, we really felt like we were we were making inroads, and I think we did. And I think your campaign's doing a lot of those same things by starting at the ground level, reaching out, talking to voters, and. And that's what's most important. From what I understand, in 2021, uh, Wallingford saw somewhere in the realm of 1,000 to 1,200 new Democratic registrations, new, v- new voter registrations that were affiliated with d- the Democratic Party. Does that sound about right? Right. I think I can't remember if it was just from that year or it might have been the presidential election as well the year before. But between those two years, it increased by almost five, 1,500, um, which is which is phenomenal. The biggest thing yeah. was we, we had a real campaign where finally you know wallingford's got one of the oldest populations in the state and it's and when especially when it comes to voting right which is which is great we need as many people voting as possible but we weren't giving and it wasn't just the democrats or the republicans it was anyone running we weren't giving enough of a reason for younger people in our town to vote mm-hmm. and to get involved even more so than voting volu- you know volunteering on the campaign and stuff like that part of it was the fact that you know you had someone in their generation running and, and myself but also, I think everything going around around, around the country um, and around the state, and especially around Wallingford, obviously, motivated them to get involved. And I think the biggest limitation, which, again, is Wallingford specific, but also nationally happening, I, we see a low voter turnout, I think, because younger people see the same people in office all the time. And truly, they think their voice right. doesn't I mean, matter. Mayor Dickinson's going on his 39th, 40th year as mayor at the national level, you know, Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell have both been there for generations. And so you think, well, maybe my vote doesn't matter because all these people might make mistakes or do bad things and they're still always going to be there. And I think finally, given how close our election got and given how close Jim Jenks before you got with Craig, uh, Craig Fishbein reminds people that, wow, my vote really, I mean, sev- seven votes. Yes. Every Your vote, vote really does matter. It, it counts. Right. It, when we're talking such low numbers in terms of the difference between winning and losing. It really is an opportunity for people to make their voice heard. And one of the things, I think this is the uh, former social studies teacher geek in me, um, one of the things that I love about campaigns to get out the vote and encouraging people to register to vote and getting more people to vote is the fact that you don't know whether they're going to vote for you or your opponent. You don't know what their political views are. You don't know if you're technically hurting yourself or not, but time and time again, the more people that vote, the more people that get engaged, it, it only benefits us as a community. It, just, it adds oversight, right? The problem right now is when you have local elections, and this is not unique to Wallingford, but it does happen here in some ways more than other places, where you'll have municipal elections with sometimes less than 30% turnout. Right. If you just do the basic math on that, that means someone with a 15% approval rating can get reelected. <laughs> That's why I kept saying for my campaign, and we did get record high turnout, but we still have a long ways to go to getting to where that turnout should be, you know, as close to 100% as you can. As long as people are at least voting, even if I'm not winning or whoever I'm supporting isn't winning, it means that there's a check on the system. Because if only a small number of people just participate, well, then you only have to impress those small number of people as opposed to the greater town and or, it's not or district. representative. Right, it's, exactly. Yeah. I worked at the polls this past election, and the people who have been working at the polls for decades were in awe of the turnout in the sense that it was a lot higher than they expected it to be. Now, remind us how close you got to, come to winning. So I think when the final votes came in that were certified by the state, it was just over... 300 votes. Which was um, the closest in? 30, 31, 30 years. Uh, since my friend Peter Gouveia ran a long time ago. I think it was actually the only one period in the last 40 years that was within 1,000 votes. Um, so it was about, you know, percentage point, percentage point and a half difference. Vote, vote, right, vote, right. vote. People difference. need to vote. Right. And even then, like I said, still hovered on 40% turnout. You know, yeah. so it's about getting more people, and especially for off-year elect, quote unquote, there's never an off-year election. I should clarify with that. But on what you would consider an off-year election, where it's on you know an odd year, not even on a statewide, statewide office level or a federal level, um, it can be tough to uh, to get people paying attention because there's so many things going on. I, I totally get it. You know, there's so many things going on 
when you're reading the paper, you have to decide every day, am I going to read what's happening in the world, what's happening in the country, or what's happening at home? Um, There's fatigue. Right. And the real irony is elected officials who most directly impact your life aren't those in D.C., aren't, you know, those in the White House. It's your local elected officials. It's your mayor. It's your town councilors. It's your state reps and your state senators. Because those are the ones, those are the ones actually passing laws and tax rates and funding for your roads, your schools, everything. Everybody pays so much attention to who the president is going to be and less so but still so much attention to who the senators and the and the congress federal congress people are going to be and don't most people don't realize how little those people have to do with their day-to-day existence it's it, just like you said it's the local and the state level laws and ordinances and and policies that affect us on a day-to-day basis it's education it's health care it's all of the stuff that people always think that has to do with the president and and it has nothing to do with the president several months ago i was at a speaking event where the the governor that lamont was speaking and one of the members of the public said hey can i send my bill for the uh flat tire I got for hitting a pothole. And I was thinking to myself, you should probably send a bill to your local mayor or wherever he's from, elected official, because again, we keep forgetting that those are the people that are affecting our lives the most directly. I think the main thing is it's just not as exciting. I totally get that. We aren't educating our kids enough as to what real civics is. You know, we're focusing, like you said, the more exciting stuff. I didn't know growing up how important local politics was. I mean, that was something I discovered as an adult. I didn't, it wasn't even something that was on my radar as a kid. And speaking of education, right, that's local decision making. I mean, that's, that's, when we think about housing, that's zoning laws. You know, when you think about businesses in town, that's local zoning. That's absolutely right. There's dozens of committees and commissions and non-elected positions that do a lot of amazing, or at least the very least important work across the town. And most people don't know who serves on them. Most people don't know that these commissions even exist or what they do. And the greatest advice I give to anyone who wants to be, in, you know, volunteer themselves to the betterment of their community is look for those where your expertise or what you're passionate about. Yeah. Um, I always looked at the park and rec commissions. I mean, they do they're so undersung and they do so much work. And Wallingford's Park and Rec is great. Right, and, there, and there's certainly limitations when it comes to funding and other things, but the, the fact that there's so many members of our community that are willing to volunteer, you know, not to rehash it too much, but the Community Pool Commission uh, at the Park and Rec, that was like an eight-year commission that just recently closed of residents fully volunteering, weren't paid at all, volunteering. They did the math thousands of hours of their personal time to, to try redesign to get this that pool, pool and everything else for our community, right? And those yeah. are the kind of people I think we forget about. None of this community would be the what it is without those commissions and those people just doing work out of the clearly not for the publicity because they're not getting any, but uh, or the recognition I should say, but just because they want their town, their community, where their family lives, where they live, where their kids are going to grow up yeah. to be as nice as they can be, and they do a great job. Well, and that's something that I found um, in getting involved in the local political community. Uh, I'm in awe of all of the people, like our people who are sitting here watching us, (laughs) who are working so hard to help get us elected, and all of the people who go out and knock doors with us, and all of the people who write postcards for us, and all of the people who do all of these things and have been doing them for decades, and they're doing it for the love of democracy. There's no other explanation. They're not getting elected. They're doing it because they're doing something they believe in. And that's been a super humbling experience for me. Super humbling. I, I, I didn't, I could never have anticipated that kind of infrastructure coming from seemingly nowhere. Yeah, and that's the great thing about local elections in general is generally you have the opportunity to know the people you're deciding between, yeah. which yeah, I guess sometimes can be a bad thing because you're just voting on whose name may be recognized. But if you're actually doing the work and talking to voters and they get to meet you, you know, all of a sudden things like party kind of wash away, all sort of things like, you know, this person's not the same generation as me, not the same background as me. Those things go away because they realize, oh, you know, this person knows what they're talking about, they're talking about or my neighbor goes to the Y with this person and that they can only speak highly of them. Like those kind of benefits in a state as big as Connecticut population-wise, way less common to meet your governor or your senator, because there's just right. there's just so many people. 
Um, but the benefit of local politics is you get to meet the people that are representing you or have the potential to represent you. And that's, that's awesome because, again, it allows you to put those other caricatures aside of yes. whether or not you vote straight, tr- usually vote straight ticket or not, or you're Republican, but you vote Democrat or Democrat that votes Republican. You just get to vote for who's best for the job and who you just believe in their character the most. Which One of my favorite responses at doors, actually, and this surprised me, is when somebody tells me that they like to do their own research or that they're not quite sure who they're going to vote for yet. It sounds bizarre that I would like that response, but I love that response because I know that that person is going to look at what I'm saying and look at my information. And I know that they're going to look at my opponent and see what he's done and see what he's said. And that makes me feel more confident that I'm going to get that person's vote because I know that they're going to educate themselves. And they're, I, I love that response. I say, you know what? That's awesome. Don't take my word for it. You know, educate yourself and, and go make your voice heard. Your first run, you did a really, really good job of bridging the gap between parties, between Democrats or Republicans or the older generation and the younger generation. How did you do that? I'm glad you brought that up because I've always been a proud Democrat my whole life. Uh, but I've grown up in a family that's mostly proud Republicans, almost entirely proud Republicans. And one, it's the best way to grow up to have those different viewpoints, in my opinion, because I had heroes like John McCain growing up, and I also had heroes like, for me, Obama, and you know, now Chris Murphy, and all these other you know, great figures from, from either side, right? So it gives you more perspective, but it also humanizes people a lot more, because, which yes. is harder now, obviously, with just the way that these kind of conversations happen online, I mean, it's harder now. To remember that people are people. Right, right, and that's it, it, so important. Yeah. And I think especially, you know, help with my election, the fact that, I mean, one of my biggest campaign points were investing in infrastructure, freezing the tax rate, and making our town safer. You can't fit those neatly into one political philosophy or another. And same for when you're running for, to represent a district at a statewide office, is being able to, like those people you're talking about that are educating themselves, those are the people that, that really keep our democracy alive. Because it's really tough to stay educated now. Which you would think with like the invention of the internet, you know, you could see anything and everything. I thought that would make educating yourself on these issues so much easier. But now there's just, it's information the, overload. Right, the echo chambers and what's real and what's not has made things, made things a lot more difficult. But I think just that level of, of humanization over the course of the $40,000 you raised for my campaign from mostly small donors, almost entire, pretty much all small donors, about a third of that came from registered Republicans in town, which I think goes to show that, you know, and I look at my family, we still have very long dinner conversations when I visit on you know, national politics and, and stuff like that. But in the 26 years I've been alive, we have never disagreed on a single town issue. When you become mayor, you're not becoming the mayor of the Democrats exactly. of Wallingford. Exactly. And, and when you say state representative, I'm going to represent everybody in my jurisdiction, not just the people who voted for me. You, you have to be able to instill in voters the confidence that you may not vote for me, but I still am your I still work for you. <laughs> You're no. still my employer. And I, and I value what you say. And I want to hear from you. Right. No, and I can attest to that. You have said those exact <laughs> words at doors. And, uh, you know, I, I know Mary Mazinski's already been on the show, but I think she's the perfect example of this because she'll knock on everyone's door. She'll talk to anyone and everyone, which is great. It's a great first step. But the most important thing she does is as a representative, she works harder than any other representative in that house for anyone. Mm-hmm. I've seen her spend days, weeks, doing research at the library on land records for helping people with, who are struggling with their landlords and other, where, you know, little things like that that add up tons of time for people that weren't even in her district, for people that were in the 90th. She was just trying to help. they were in Wallingford, they knew Mary, worked hard, and they reached out to her and she did it. These aren't even people that voted for her. That's the, that's the key thing, because whether it's mayor or whether it's state rep, or whether it's governor, for crying out loud, the biggest thing isn't party or political philosophy even, it's just who's going to put in the work is 50% of it. The other 50% is who's going to surround themselves with the right experts for when, you know, you it's going into a field that you don't know as much about. I love the fact that you say that because, admittedly, I'm new to the political sphere, and I have my few areas that... 
I consider myself highly knowledgeable in, but there's just a few of them. But there's a whole lot of issues that have to be legislated and discussed and researched. And I love the fact that you're highlighting the importance of talking to the people who are experts in what they do. Because a lot of times people will ask me, well, how will you accomplish this? Or how will you accomplish something in an area that I'm not knowledgeable about? And I'm very honest and I say, you know what? I'm gonna talk to the people who know. I'm gonna talk to the people who are the experts because if you want it done correctly, then you need to surround yourself with people who know what they're doing. And I know that you've faced criticism for your youth. For, and, and you knew that during the campaign. And in fact, when people at doors have asked me about you and whether you're running again, and they say, well, he's just a little young, I say, call him. Call him and talk to him. You're not going to offend him if you say that to him. He will talk to you and he will explain to you why that doesn't matter. I do always welcome the question when people ask how old I am at doors because then I'm fine knowing that when I do talk about all the policies, all, all of my platform, every single time they go, well, even if they're not going to vote for me, they know at least he knows what he's talking about. I want their main takeaway to be. One of a uh, Wallingford resident messaged my campaign social media uh, early this week saying, I think you might want to grow a beard. You might look a little, a little older. And I said, look, if I could, I probably would. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm not no. trying to trick people. <laughs> no, no, no. And I think, um, look, when it comes to Age has very little to do with it, I think, because when it comes to experience is great, but the, I think the record of the current mayor is showing that experience can hurt you when you block other people out. I mean, look, when, whenever a department head comes saying, hey, you know, when the fire chief comes and, hey, my fire uh, department members want direct deposit. Oh, you don't need direct deposit. Just the ongoing you, issue with the lack of social media presence of the right, town. Right, And they... It, it's well, like falling on deaf ears that how important it is to have that presence. Again, it comes back to leaning on people who know what they're talking about. The police chief coming to you and coming to the town council saying, hey, I'd like to have a Facebook page. I think it's really important because we can reach out to the community, we can show the good work we're doing, and when there's a road closure or, God forbid, an emergency, we can post those things. The, the biggest social media network in Wallingford is Positively Wallingford that was created during uh, the hurricane the snowstorm set nine, ten years ago so that people could post on there, I need food, you know, I, I can't get out of my driveway, like, and the community can help each other. That's phenomenal, but that shouldn't fall on the community to organize. Keep. So it just goes to show... It's a critical issue. Right. And when everyone agrees on it, but one person who does not understand it right. is the big thing. I go back to the animal shelter. The, per, the chief animal control officer was requesting out of need animal air conditioning, and the mayor decided they didn't need it. And that's the real issue. It's not these individual events, but time and time again... It's a pattern. Thinking, I think when you're in... And, it, and this is not you know, to be negative against the mayor. I think this is inherent with anyone who's been in the same position for that long. You run the risk of thinking you know best on everything and you become complacent in that regard. And people do want innovation and right. change. Uh, they, I'm hearing that people want new thinkers, new decision makers, new ideas, and they just don't necessarily understand that the way that they get that is by showing up and voting for those people. Um, and that falls on us in terms of educating 100%. voters and saying, we're hearing you. We understand what you're asking for. Uh, one of the things that I have found just in the last couple of weeks is when I tell people that I want to accomplish things for them, for the town of Wallingford, for Middlefield, for the 90th district. And in order to do that, I need to be able to reach across the aisle. I need to be able to talk to the other members of the House, the General Assembly. I need to be able to research and talk to the experts and listen to the voters. And quite frankly, that's not something that our current representative does. It's, it's always a tough conversation to have with folks with any campaign when you're against an incumbent and even though our state and our town has its limitations and its issues one that obviously everyone here loves right and obviously we love because otherwise we wouldn't care we wouldn't be doing all this to to elect you'll get elected and make it an even better place so it's trying to have that conversation of 
obviously you have to point out the limitations and, and what we're doing wrong because that's what you're running to change to fix but you also have to with, at the same time reassuring people that you know we're not flipping everything upside we're not flipping the table upside down right we are and it's the same problem with how we communicate with this for both parties i think um countrywide right where as soon as you point out something wrong with the united states and you want to fix it and you're working hard to fix it people think you hate the country quite the opposite it's love wor- it's, it's love good. it's out of love it's right, right. it's an, it's an action out of love because you're trying to make what's already a great town a great state right. even better <laughs> we're, right? we're running to to, to just improve better it. and strengthen yeah. and, and what's already a good system too but yes. like you said innovation and just having an ear out for for the community which yes. especially you know I, I obviously tend to focus on my own opponent but especially in your case you know, just by the fact that you're getting out there in the community, listening to people, running against someone who is known for not doing that, who is known for only voting no on everything without having any actual proposals, right? Um, I think is is so important. One of my big points is this juvenile justice issue that I think people are surprised to hear that it's not that I I, I want to be easy on crime. No, no, actually, I think we all agree. It's not a Democrat-Republican issue. We all agree we want there to be less crime. We all agree, like you said before, that we want it to be safer. It's understanding the real information, and, and that's, what we're, that's what we're bringing to the voters. Focusing on the facts. Yes. It, you know, I think that's what, unfortunately, I think has become more of the mantra of, of the party that we're trying to run for, is a focus on the facts and the reality situation. As you know, you were a public defender before in D.C. or in the D.C. area, and I was working at the Department of Justice before I came back to Wallingford um, as the other side, on the prosecution side. Right. And even at the top levels, I was doing white-collar crime primarily, you know, corporations' crimes, but even at the top level, or especially at the top level, I should say, of law enforcement in this country, we have all these stats. We have all this data that shows that, you know, changing the punishment to some ridiculously, you know, say, you know, maximum prison sentence for stealing a car, just as an example. Mm -hmm. So life in prison, something that doesn't exist, obviously, but just as a hypothetical, has no impact. Because when you go to commit a crime, uh, not that you and I are committing many crimes. (laughs) Correct, yes. But uh, when you go to- Rest assured. When when, when folks, and we have all the data on this, and this is why at the DOJ, we try to push legislation that would actually solve the problems. Where when you just have these nonsensical, um, and I'm not saying we have this in Connecticut, but when you talk about it in this context, right. when someone's committing a crime, they're not thinking about, you know, oh, if I, you know, uh, do this one thing one minute in, then it becomes a five-year sentence instead of a four-year sentence and all this thing. This is not how, how the calculus works. Now, that being said, there is a lot of stuff that needs to be done to address um, not necessarily juvenile crime, but just crime in general in Connecticut. It's not nearly as bad as some people want to make it out to be. But the problem is, whenever we have a sensible solution, like what Mary Majinski and Liz Linehan proposed with the catalytic converters, right. for instance, where, okay, well, here's Cut a practical... Cut off the pipeline. Right. Here's a practical solution to this real problem. You can no longer sell catalytic converters without the proper permits and the certain numbers in the certain days within Connecticut and then our, once their fellow New England states do the same, that cuts off the pipeline, cuts off the criminal motivations and helps actually solve that problem. When you have just... Like your opponent, reactive, reactive, fear mongering. You can have real issues, but if you have a real issue, you have to come to the table with a real solution. That's what why we need people like you, people like Liz, people like Mary at the table. Yes, I could not agree with you more. Well, believe it or not, we have run ourselves right out of time. So I want to thank everybody uh, for tuning in and watching us here on Groundwork. I'm Rebecca Highland. Again, I'm running to be state representative of the 90th district. And I want to thank Riley O'Connell uh, for his dedication to Wallingford. And remember that he will be on the ballot next year in the 2023 election cycle uh, for mayor of Wallingford. So thank you, Riley. Thanks so much for having me. It was a great time. Great time. Thank you. Thank you.